It's time for oral questions. Please recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you very, um, very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Deputy Premier. Why is the Premier cutting new funding for mental health by $330 million a year? Deputy Premier. Thank you. Well, to, thank you for the question, but in fact, we are adding to funding for mental health. We are committing $3.8 billion over 10 years, $1.9 billion from the provincial government to match the $1.9 billion coming from the federal government. The Liberal government in the past made a lot of promises during the election campaign, but we know how solid those promises are and we know how accurate they are. This is the biggest commitment in Canadian history to mental health and addictions. We are committed to creating a comprehensive system that addresses all of the needs of the people of Ontario. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, Addictions and Mental Health Ontario says $2.4 billion in new funding is needed over the next four years. But instead of delivering, the Premier is dragging Ontario backwards. The Premier has cut $2.1 billion over four years and replaced it with $1.9 billion over 10 years. Now, even the Premier can do that math, Speaker. Instead of delivering, the Premier is dragging Ontario backwards. Why is the Premier of Ontario cutting new funding by $330 million each and every year and leaving thousands of people without the mental health care that they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. That is not happening. We are adding to mental health funding. I would suggest that the Leader of the Official Opposition's math is about as bad as the previous Liberal government's math. We made a commitment to the people of Ontario that we are going to create a comprehensive system. We are making the biggest investment in Canadian history, and we are going to follow through on that. We made a promise to the people of Ontario. Promise made, promise kept. Start the clock. Final supplementary. Twelve thousand children waiting over 18 months to get the health care, the mental health care supports that they need. It is disgraceful. And there are 13,000 people in Toronto alone waiting five years for the supportive housing that they need. The Premier's cut of $330 million annually is not going to end the crisis that we continue to have in mental health care in this province. Why is this government and this Premier cutting funding for mental health care services that are so desperately needed across our province? Response. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. I am certainly well aware of the situation for mental health and addictions in the province of Ontario. I am doing something about it. We're making the biggest commitment in Canadian history. I can't hear the Deputy Premier because of the noise coming from the government side. I have to be able to hear the member who's answering the question or asking the question. Deputy Premier. And may I remind the Leader of the Official Opposition that there was a select committee on mental health and addictions in Ontario that all three parties worked on. But, however, may I remind the member that the Liberal government was the government that didn't do anything on this file? May I Order. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Deputy Premier. 
The Premier is driven by backroom deals that help his friends, and we see it again with the disastrous decision to deny climate change and drag Ontario backwards. Cancelling cap-and-trade helps big polluters and puts more money in the pockets of the richest people in our province. In fact, Families making over $150,000 a year are going to benefit by about $430 each and every year in their pockets, where low-income families are going to get $8.58 a month. So why is the Premier helping the biggest polluters and the richest people while the little guy gets stiffed? That's right. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. Sorry. Uh, the uh, Ontario's carbon tax era is over. Members will take their seats. We start the clock. A commitment. A clear commitment to put money back into the pockets of Ontarians. We will be putting $260 back into their pockets. We know where this side of the House stands. We're against a carbon tax. How much will the carbon tax be that the Leader of the Opposition would propose? Oh, okay. Will it be the highest carbon tax in the world, yes. as our caucus has provided? Yes. Yes. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, anywhere you, any way you cut it, the little guy's getting stiffed. $8.58 a month is the only benefit that everyday families are going to see, while the richest Ontarians and the biggest polluters are going to be laughing all the way to the bank, just like the Conservatives like it, because that's what they're all about. The Premier, the Premier is the biggest friend that big polluters have seen in years in this province. The Premier's climate change denial legislation says that the government will set targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I, asked, I, asked, I want to ask this government. Uh, will they commit to ensuring that their new targets that they're going to be bringing forward, apparently, are higher and tougher than Ontario's current targets, or are they going to be beholden to big polluters? Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate this, the Leader of the Opposition is correct. We are going to be putting targets forward. It is required as part of the bill, as you, as you would expect. But, but what, I, what I find difficult is, is how the NDP and the Leader of the Opposition makes light of putting money back into taxpayers' pockets. It's shameful. It, it shows a lack of understanding of the reality in Ontario for working families today. These families need the money. We were elected on this commitment, the commitment to put money back in people's pockets, to get rid of a carbon tax, to get rid of a cap-and-trade scheme that wasn't working. And that's what we're doing. Final Sit down. Please take your seats. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Final supplementary. Well, the Premier takes care of big polluters and the richest people and stiffs the little guy with 858 a month. He's creating a massive uncertainty for Ontario's job creator speaker and for everyone who has a contract with the Ontario government. Yep. The Business Council of Canada says that the Premier's decisions are undermining investor confidence yep. and putting Ontario's reputation at risk. Right. Under cap and trade, businesses spent billions for allowances, trusting that they would be honoured. With the stroke of a pen, the Premier says those credits are now worthless. How can anyone trust the Premier to respect a contract? Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, the feedback I've been getting from business is positive about this government. The business understands, job creators understand, that a lower tax, lower regulation regime is what's going to create jobs. But I'll return the question, perhaps for another one, to the, to the Leader of the Opposition. How much is too much for your carbon tax? Is it $20? Is it $50, which the Prime Minister wants to call it? Is it $150? What is too much in terms of tax for Ontarians for the NDP? Question. Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. My next question is for the Deputy Premier. Ontario is in the midst of an opioid overdose crisis, an emergency. Supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites are saving lives in cities and towns across our province each and every day. But for two days in a row, the Premier of this province has refused to say that he supports this life-saving work. 
Will the Deputy Premier commit today to keep Ontario's supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites open in order to keep saving lives? Deputy Premier. Well, thank you to the Leader of the Official Opposition for her question. As Premier Ford has indicated, he wants to know the evidence about the supervised exactly. injection exactly. sites and the overdose prevention sites. As a matter of fact, I had a meeting with the Ministry of Health representatives yesterday. I am starting my consultation process. I am going to be rendering a report to the Premier in the near future. We do take this very seriously. We are losing too many people from the opioid overdose problem. We are taking action right away, and we will be making a decision in the very near future. The, oh, the evidence is overwhelmingly clear, Speaker, and maybe the Premier should have done his homework before making people very, very worried about the future of the safe injection sites in our province. The effectiveness of supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites has been studied for years and years and years. That's why they've been put in place by so many communities across our country. And in Ontario, they are saving lives each and every day. During the campaign, the Premier said he was dead against these sites. He ignored all of the public health evidence and ignored the voices of communities across Ontario. Will the Deputy Premier end the uncertainty right now Acknowledge that the research has been done, do the homework, and commit to keeping Ontario's supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites open so they can keep saving lives in Ontario. Deputy Premier, to respond. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Through you to the Leader of the Official Opposition. We are very well aware of the situation. As you will know, the Premier subsequently made a comment indicating that he wanted to see the evidence to uh, support the use of continued supervised injection sites and overdose prevention sites. We are taking a look at that now. We are gathering the evidence. I will be making a report to the Premier in the very near future. It is a priority for me and for the Ministry of Health. We are working on it now. We want to make sure that we can come to the right decision, and we will. Thank you. Question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. One of the pillars of our Ontario PC government's plan for the people was to end the cap-and-trade program. Yeah. Nothing more than another Liberal slush fund. I'm sure, like me, my colleagues on this side of the House heard time and time again that their constituents have had enough of this program put in place by the previous government. We've heard, Mr. Speaker, that the people of Ontario are fed up. They need life in this province to be affordable again. I'd like to ask the Minister, for the benefit of the House, how this ineffective program put a strain on our economy and the people of Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, through you to the member from Willowdale, and thank you for the question, and I'm certainly impressed by all the friends and family you have. Um, Mr. Speaker, our government was elected on a clear, a clear mandate to put people first and make life affordable for families in Ontario. Equally clear was our commitment to scrap the previous Liberal government's cap-and-trade program, and, uh, and that is what we're doing. It was an honour to stand in this place yesterday and to introduce that bill and my first piece of legislation as a minister here. And in doing so, we fulfil a promise to the people of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we understand the challenges of climate change. We understand the problem. We disagree on the solution. The member asked, what were the problems? The problems were that the cap-and-trade system, a carbon tax system, punishes the low- and middle-income families. It punishes them daily for just simple choices, like choosing to drive a car. That's not the solutions that we think will work. We will bring forward those solutions. Thank you. But today, we're talking about the end of the carbon tax era. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for another excellent answer. Mr. Speaker, for years, families have struggled with the increased cost associated with this regressive tax. We've all heard the stories where people are literally having to choose between heating and eating. Businesses, Mr. Speaker, have also been reaching out to our PC government, begging us 
for us to put an end to this program. They simply can't compete with businesses in other jurisdictions while under the enormous weight of this tax. Yesterday, the minister said that, quote, this government was very clear with the mandate that it received from the people of Ontario, end quote. It is staying true to its promises and scrapping this job-killing tax. Can the minister explain in real terms what this legislation will mean for Ontario families and businesses? Yeah. Through, through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Willowdale uh, for the hard work he does for his constituents. I know he cares deeply, deeply about their best interests and the best interests of the, of the province of Ontario. Okay. Mr. Speaker, a cap-and-trade carbon tax is a price increase on everything. We all know that, that winding down that price increase will be to the benefit of Ontarians. It's a key step in fulfilling our government's commitment, and it is an important next step in our other commitment to reduce gas prices by 10 cents a litre. Cheaper gas prices, lower energy bills will put more money in people's pockets. Now, Again, on the other side of the House, they make light of money in people's pockets, but that's going to mean $260 for an average Ontario family every year, year over year. In addition to saving the money, we will eliminate the cost burden on Ontario businesses, giving them the potential to grow. And it's anticipated that the cancellation of cap and trade and the increase in fuel tax will increase Ontario employment by 14,000 jobs for Ontario families. Wow. That's what's in it to cancel cap Thank and trade. You. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, this past weekend, we have a wonderful festival in Davenport called Big on Bloor, and at that festival, I met with many people who were gravely concerned about the repeal of the up updated sexual education curriculum. We had a petition circulating, Mr. Speaker, and within just a few hours, we had over 1,200 signatures. So many people opened up to us with their stories. They express their very real fear that being excluded from the curriculum will force LGBTQ kids back into the closet. That means living in fear, depression, and with thoughts of suicide. People kept asking us the same question, why are we going backwards? So I will ask this minister to stand up for all the students and young people she is responsible for and ensure the 2015 curriculum remains in place, moving us forward, not backward. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to assure this House I'm standing up for students across this province every, every day. Every day. And in saying that, I, I invite the member opposite to join me in making sure that people in her constituency are aware of the comprehensive consultation we're going to be embarking on this fall. We're respecting parents and we're following through on a campaign province, promise excuse me, because so many people were not listened to, and I look forward to everyone in working this House together. working with Let's me work to together. ensure parents here, here. are respected and every voice is Please take the clock. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it is the youth, it is the youth and the children and the students who are calling on you not to revert back to the 1998 uh, curriculum. Yeah. Dragging the curriculum back to the 1998 version and starting the consultation in September completely fails the kids who are going to be in classrooms this fall, just a few weeks from now. This government is leaving students vulnerable to online bullying and it's leaving kids without the language or tools to talk about consent and what a healthy or unhealthy relationship is. Mr. Speaker, whether this government likes it or not, we live in 2018, not 1818. I apologize. I'd ask the, the members to come to order so that I can hear the member who's so close to me and I can't even hear. Response? Minister. I have not Mr. Speaker, I would like to respond by sharing a quote from the federal leader of the NDP party. Oh, I'm Mr. interested. Mr. Mr. Singh say? said, when it comes to proper consultation, it's clear the Liberal government has not learned from previous mistakes. Oh. Mr. Singh went on to say, the lack of inclusive consultation before announcing the curriculum was disrespectful to my parents and my constituency and a mistake on the Liberal government's part. Oh. So, Speaker, 
I share with you, everyone in this House, and the people across this province. We are going to get it right, and I invite everyone to encourage people in their constituency to get engaged this fall as we embark on the most comprehensive consultation the Ministry Judge of Education agrees. has ever seen. Restart the clock. Next question, the member from Mississauga Streetsville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I have been watching the debate on immigration during question period in this House and with the federal government. Minister, first I must congratulate you for your respectful tone and for standing up for Ontario, its citizens and taxpayers. Unfortunately, the tone from the federal government isn't as respectful, nor is it straightforward in its responses. I saw Minister Hussain on television Tuesday evening, and he now claims he doesn't know how much illegal border crosses have cost Ontario. Have you asked the federal minister for compensation, and will you issue a formal bill? Member, I am so proud and delighted that she has become a member of this assembly. Uh, her and I travelled to India a few years ago, and uh, we've come a long way since then. Congratulations. Um, Ontario obviously is a very welcoming society, and uh, as evidenced on the benches of this uh, new government of yours, we have over 20 people who have immigrated or were refugees to this country in the Progressive Conservative Caucus. And I'm very proud of With the situation that's happening at the border right now in Quebec, there has been an unprecedented strain on our resources here in the province of Ontario. That is why I travelled to Ottawa earlier this week to indicate to the federal government that we have a, a price tag of about $200 million, and they are only willing to come forward with about $11 million. Let me itemize this bill for you, Speaker. $20 million in education costs, $90 million in social assistance Spons. costs, uh, $74 million in shelter costs for Toronto, $12 million for, for shelter costs in the city of Ottawa. We need the money. We're going to stand up for the province of Ontario. Stop the clock. Members will take their seats. Please take your seats. We start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. I thank the member for her answer and appreciate that the implication is Mr. Hussain doesn't consider these formal meetings useful or that what is said isn't listened to. My supplemental question on the same topic relates to this bill that keeps growing. How much is the bill for Ontario and its municipalities? And is the federal government a partner to Ontario? Do you expect that they will pay this bill? And for the question, uh, very important. The price tag right now for the province of Ontario uh, in response to the crisis created by the federal Liberal government is $200 million. Earlier today, I sent a letter off to the federal government itemizing those costs, requesting uh, compensation to make Ontario whole. Uh, Speaker, we will have a looming crisis on August the 9th, uh, given that there are 800 people that are in college dormitories in, this in the city of Toronto that will need to be vacated. Uh, we have not heard from the federal government what the relocation plan is uh, for those individuals. So I can tell you today we're going to have a vote in the House. I do hope the New Democrats and I do hope the independent members will stand with every member of this government for the province of Ontario, for the people, and ensure that the federal government pays its Stop the clock. <laughs> members will take their seats. Restart the clock. Member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Deputy Premier. Schools across Ontario are crumbling, but instead of fixing our schools, the Premier chose to cut $100 million from school repairs. Does the Deputy Premier think cutting $100 million from school repairs is good for students and for the next generation? Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. 
Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I'm pleased to share with the House today that we understand that over the last 15 years, the Liberal government allowed schools to crumble, and it is absolutely concerning. And that's why I'm pleased with we're, the work that we're moving forward with in terms of working with both ministry officials as well as, Toronto, as school boards across this province, and we are going to get it right and address priorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Deputy Premier. The Premier told Ontarians that he was cancelling school repairs because of his short-sighted decision to cancel cap and trade. But in yesterday's briefing on Bill 4, it turns out that that's not true. Nothing, nothing is stopping the government from fixing schools. The cap-and-trade money was collected. It is available. These projects can move forward. So why is the Premier not fixing our schools? Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I think it's very important that we take the time today and share with the members opposite that the GGRF does not repair boilers. It does not repair the crumbling schools that happen under the Liberals' watch. That's right. And that's why I am so pleased that I am committed to fixing schools. And we are going to be working with our ministry officials as well as our school boards to get it right and clean up the Liberal mess once here, and for here, all. Here, here, here. Next question. Restart the clock. The member for Mississauga Streetsville. No, sorry, Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The cap-and-trade carbon tax is nothing more than a tax grab that punishes families and chases jobs out of Ontario. We promised that we would eliminate this tax, and we are keeping our promise. Yesterday, the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks announced details of the legislation that would, if passed, formally end the cap-and-trade carbon tax era in Ontario. I have heard from many constituents who are praising this move by our government. Speaker, I understand that this legislation would wind down the cap and trade carbon tax in a way that minimizes the risk to taxpayers while offering some support uh, for eligible registered participants in the previous program. Would the minister please explain to this House what is, con uh, what is contained in this question. legislation? Good question. Mr. Environment. So, Mr. Speaker, through you to the member from Aurora, Oak Ridges and Richmond Hill, and thank you for that, that, that well thought out and insightful question. Uh, th the member asks the question and gives us an opportunity to explain the bill. The proposed legislation is about the responsible wind down of, of the cap and trade program. It's also about minimizing the cost to taxpayers. It includes the repeal of the cap and trade legislation, extinguishing of allowance, protecting taxpayers from further costs, and setting out a regulatory framework for authority around compensation. Compensation, however, will not be given to people who got free credits. Compensation will not be given to people who have used their credits for polluting. Compensation will be given appropriately, and that compensation estimate is considerably less than the many billions of dollars that were estimated before. And yes, Mr. Speaker, it also requires us, requires us to develop a plan around climate change, develop targets, and report back, which we will do. Good Mr. Speaker, back to the minister. Thank you very much for this response, minister. I'm pleased to learn about the, this important legislation that expects, that respects taxpayers and fulfills our commitment to the people of Ontario. I have heard from many constituents who have concerns about our about the about our environment. While they don't believe that our taxes are an appropriate solution, they are recognize the challenges that crime that climate change uh, presents. The Liberals' cap-and-trade carbon tax failed to deliver results and was nothing more than a tax grab. They want action to address environmental priorities, including clean air and water, conservation, lowering emissions, and reducing litter and waste. Can the minister please tell the House how he plans to balance these priorities? Minister. 
through you to the member from Aurora Oak Ridge's Richmond Hill, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I can tell you that our government looks forward to moving past the previous government's obsession with raising taxes and towards a working environmental plan that's supported by the people of Ontario. Our plan for the people made it clear that we'll deliver on clean air and water, conservation, reducing emissions, and cleaning up litter, garbage, and waste. If passed, the legislation we are tabling will help us put together a plan that better addresses the real environmental concerns, including fighting climate change. Mr. Speaker, our commitment is to put an effective plan in place. Our commitment is to do so without a regressive tax on the people of Ontario. My question is to the Minister for Municipal Affairs and Housing. Recently, I was approached by a resident in my riding of University Rosedale who is in distress because their landlord is trying to illegally evict them from their home. Her fear that is, if she is evicted, she will not be able to afford to live in the neighbourhood that she loves, where she'll have to find a new school for her son, where she'll have to find a new daycare for her son, uh, say goodbye to many of her friends and no longer be close to the job where she is located. Provided that she can even find an apartment, a one-bedroom in Toronto, as you probably all now know, uh, rents for an average of $2,080 a month. It's now the highest in Canada. Ontarians should not be pushed out of the neighbourhoods that they know and love because of skyrocketing housing and unaffordable rent. My question is, when will this government, what will this government do to ensure that renters can afford to put a roof over their head? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker, and I want to congratulate uh, the member on being elected. I look forward to, uh, to working with her in the chamber. Um, the issue of uh, affordable housing, uh, both in the rental market and also in the home ownership market, is a problem we're very much aware of, particularly in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton areas. Uh, my ministry uh, works uh, very diligently with our community partners, with, our, with the real estate industry, with uh, developers, but also with our municipal partners and the federal government. And we're very aware of, uh, of bringing in more supply, and, and supply is, uh, I think, a key component. In my supplementary uh, speaker, uh, I'll address her concerns regarding the Residential Tenancies Act and the issues that her constituent is having. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you for bringing up the question about supply. Uh, a new report just came out, it was released by Acorn Canada, and it shows that over 40,000 new rental units have been built in Toronto over the last four years. However, only 1,000 of them are affordable. That's one in 40 units. So Torontonians are finding it harder and harder and harder to find an affordable place that they can live in, and that's completely unacceptable. When will this Conservative government commit to fixing Toronto's housing crisis so that families are not scrambling to pay the rent? Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker. Then I, I guess I will uh, continue with supply rather than the Residential Tenancies Act. But I, I, you know, if, you, if we would like to talk offline about some of the issues that our tenant is facing, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to engage with you. In the issue of supply, Speaker, I, I think our government was, uh, was crystal clear during the election. Uh, we're going to cut red tape and we're going to streamline approvals to get more affordable housing online faster. It's a, it's a responsibility, as I said in the opening question, that uh, we have many, many stakeholders we want to work towards. I've had a number of conversations uh, with Mayor Tory uh, since my appointment to Cabinet. He's made it crystal clear to me that uh, supply and affordable housing is top of mind for him. Uh, I plan on working with him and our other municipal partners. Uh, Speaker, we have uh, some fantastic uh, service managers and Indigenous program administrators Response. that my ministry works with. It's something that we share, it's something that we're aware of, and we're something that we're to the opposition of working actually with. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. A member for Kitchener, South Hesper. Mr. Speaker, my question today is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Minister, I've been appalled by the treatment that you have received during the federal immigration hearings. The Liberal members of that committee chose to question your motives, suggesting racism and hatred lies in your request for fair treatment. They chose to ask questions about France, hate crimes, UN conventions, and your language, rather than about the real impact illegal border crossers are having on Ontario. 
I have heard that bill for welfare, housing, education and immediate support is now over $200 million. I heard this week that you will support my motion today in this House to make it known to the federal government that your requests for compensation are to be supported by wide-ranging Ontarians. So what I want to know from you, will you support my motion? Member for her question and her uh, and her uh, her great question and for her election to this house. Uh, let me be perfectly clear: every member on the government side will vote for her motion. We will stand up for the integrity of our immigration system in the province of Ontario and for the and and, and nationally. And we're going to continue to welcome newcomers. But we have to be crystal clear with the federal government. She's right. The tone taken by the Liberal members um, at the House of Commons was absolutely appalling. They were not trying to be constructive. I went. There with a $200 million price tag speaker, and I'm going to continue to press the federal government Fairness. to invest in Ontario and to make sure that we are not only whole, but we're able to, to provide the public services our people so desperately need in the province of Ontario. So I'll ask the Liberals and the NDP and the Green, are you going to be with us or are you going to be against us this afternoon? Members will take their seats. Members will please take their seats. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Back to the minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the minister for supporting me and for her answer. I'm glad my motion is coming forward today and that it will have the support of this government. My hope is that the federal government will be honest and upstanding partner that will foot its bill. My supplemental question, though, relates to the federal government's role in immigration. I understand the federal government has the full authority over our borders and immigration system. What I would like to know, Minister, does our immigration system have integrity? Mr. Uh, one of the most diverse ridings in uh, in Ontario. Uh, the riding of Nepean is is very diverse, welcoming people, uh, not just like me from other parts of Canada, but people from all over the world. And that has made, I think, our community richer. Um, and and I, I really value that. But let me be perfectly clear: when I attended the federal hearings this past week, there are some challenges within our immigration system that are testing the people of Ontario's patience. It is the turnaround time for claimants that is uh, an issue. There is an issue at the border. I'm heartened that the federal government has appointed Minister Bill Blair to deal with the challenges that they have at the border, but they also have to come to grips with the $200 million price tag that it's costing this government. So I would encourage the members opposite who decide they want to rant and rave over there rather than be constructive on this issue to vote for us today and make Ontario whole. We start the clock. Member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. In response to the lack of affordable housing and ever increasing rents in Parkdale High Park, residents have organized, fought back, and successfully used rent strikes to stop corporate landlords from gouging them. One of the buildings that was successful is 1251 King Street West. But now the landlord, Nusper, has retaliated issuing an eviction notice to the lead organizer, Mark, and his wife, Petrusa, and their newborn son. It is clear to Mark and Petrusa's neighbors that this eviction is punishment for Mark's role in the rent strike. Will this government commit today to implementing real rent control, stopping above guideline rent increases, creating a rent registry, and protecting the rights of tenants like Mark and Petrusa? Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker, and I want to thank the uh, member for Parkdale High Park for the question. I want to congratulate her on her election to the Assembly. I look forward to, uh, to working with her. Uh, my ministry has uh, obviously been monitoring the situation in Parkdale High Park uh, and, uh, and looking at uh, that, the situation. Uh, obviously, the uh, Residential Tenancies Act uh, does establish a, a framework for tenants to be able to uh, 
uh, provide uh, those comments or regarding what a, what a landlord has been doing for them. The framework is very clearly spelled out, and uh, certainly there are, are remedies there for the, uh, the, the tenant uh, to be able to express uh, some of the things that the uh, landlord has been, been done. I think the process, uh, certainly I've heard since my uh, appointment to Cabinet, I've heard from uh, both landlords and tenants uh, regarding uh, the situation with the Residential Tenancies Act and the mm -hmm. Landlord Tenant Board. I'd uh, be more than happy Response. in the supplemental to uh, provide more information to the member. Supplementary. Back to the minister. Parkdale Organized is holding a rally outside the Landlord and Tenant Board on August 1st, the same day that Mark and Petrusa will have to appear for a hearing to fight their eviction notice. Residents of Parkdale High Park will be there to show their support for their neighbours and send a message that they will not be bullied by corporate landlords. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to know from this minister whose side is the government on? Will they stand with the tenants and introduce legislation to protect them, or will they take the side of corporate landlords? Minister, stop. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Speaker. I want to remind the member that the uh, Residential Tenants, uh, Tenancies Act establishes the Landlord Tenant Board, which is an independent uh, tribunal with the authority to resolve those disputes uh, between landlords and tenants. And I want to, again, remind the member that under the Residential Tenancies Act, every tenant, I want to stress that, every tenant that faces eviction has a right for that hearing at the Landlord Tenant right. Board. The Act uh, is very specific in terms of how landlords must act with tenants. It's an independent tribunal, and it would be inappropriate for me to comment on something that is before the tribunal at this time. Thank you. Next question, member for Simcoe North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. We understand the need to create a climate for companies to choose Ontario to invest in. Yesterday afternoon, Amazon made an announcement about bringing jobs and businesses to Ontario. Can the minister please give the House an update on what the announcement was? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank the uh, honourable member for the for the question. Yesterday was a great day for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and it it shows that. Uh, and Ontario sure is open for business, and I want to thank Amazon for announcing their 1 million square foot facility that will create more than 800 full-time jobs for the people of Ontario. We need, uh, we need more companies like Amazon to come to Ontario and bring those new jobs, and that's what we work on in my ministry, and every ministry has that mandate because it's a priority, a uh, very high priority for the government of Ontario. So I thank Amazon, but I also want to thank our member from Dufferin Caledon, who played a key role in landing this investment in her riding. So congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we promised the people of Ontario that we would work to make Ontario open for business once again, and we're doing that by lowering taxes and putting more money in people's talk pockets, cleaning up the hydro. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister for that response. I would also like to extend my congratulations to Amazon for their announcement on bringing jobs and business to Ontario. Will the minister please explain to the House, and most importantly to the opposition, why it is so important for Ontario to be open for business? It's extremely important. Thank you again for the question, Mr. Speaker. It's, it's, it's obvious, I think, to all of us on, on this side of the House, and I hope to everyone, that uh, being open for business is, is crucial. And we need to break down those regu regulatory barriers that were put up by previous governments, especially the government the last 15 years, some 360,000 regulations that businesses and individuals have to try and deal with, and some of them are extremely ridiculous, Mr. Speaker, and we have them in all our departments. So we have a, a, a uh, a deputy minister that's been established to go through those regulations and make recommendations to cabinet and to caucus and uh, really truly roll out the red carpet so that the people of Ontario, the hardworking people of Ontario, those people, those million people on social assistance have an opportunity to have a hand up, to get a job, to put food on the table for their family, to not rely on the state, but to contribute to society by paying their taxes, raising their children. That's what we're elected to do. That's what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker. 
the clock. Members will take their seats. Next question. Member for London Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Environment and Conservation and Parks. Speaker, of course, when this government cancelled cap and trade, it killed a number of green initiatives with it. The green energy car rebate was good for the environment, but it was also good for the economy. 20 models of electric hydrogen fueled cars qualified for the consumer rebate. Morgan works at the Finch Auto Dealership in London, Speaker, and he is worried because the abrupt end to the climate change plan through cap and trade has meant an abrupt drop off on sales of eco friendly, energy efficient cars. What do you? say to the car companies, car dealers, who saw this, their business increase due to the green energy trades. Minister of the Environment. Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from uh, London Fanshawe for the question, and congratulations to her for being uh, re-elected again as well. <laughs> Our government ran on a platform an absolute promise of getting rid of the absolute unfair cap-and-trade tax in this province. As part, of that, as part of that, we also had to eliminate the programs that were being funded by that unfair tax. The electric vehicle program, we made it very clear that that would be one of the programs that would be lost. But we also were extremely fair in the way that we ended it. We gave, on a July 11th, we announced it until September 10th. All dealers and anyone who had purchased a vehicle or had a vehicle in order, as long as, it was as long as it was plated and delivered by September 10th, and it was other than, other than Tesla, they would receive their rebate. We Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. These were luxury cars. They were priced within range of a new car, and the rebate was significant for consumers. Due to the rebate, car manufacturers and retailers saw a 120 per cent increase in sales last year. Green car initiatives were both worth, were worth $175 million to the economy since being introduced. Good for the environment, good for the economy, Speaker. What does the minister have to say to car manufacturers, job creators in the province, car dealers and consumers who relied on this rebate program. Minister of Transportation. Well, well, thank you again to the member. A $1.9 billion punishing tax on families is not good for the economy. <laughs> Members will take your seats. Start a liter gasoline, as proposed by members of your party, is not good for the economy. So I say to the member, when we eliminate that unfair tax, we ended the program for rebates that everyone in Ontario was paying for, but only some were benefiting by. We were absolutely fair in the way that we came, brought about an end to the program. People understood during the campaign Spons. that this program would end because it was part of our cap and trade promised end. Promi Thank you. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Here, here. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility. During the election campaign, I knocked on many doors and heard from many seniors and their families. One question I heard often was, how are seniors living in retirement homes protected in Ontario? Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please share with us how you're protecting and your, how you and your ministry are protecting our seniors? Good question. Minister responsible for seniors and accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Through you, I want to thank the member for asking me my first question as a minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's an honor for me to stand up in this house, especially after being hit by a stroke a couple of days after my election. And somehow, our premier designate, Dr. Ford, found out within an hour after my admission to the hospital, wow. the premier was there to visit me. I want to thank the premier. And also, I would like to thank all the members in this house in advance for having to put up with my speechy articulation after my stroke. Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that seniors in retirement homes all across the province are treated with the care and respect. If you operate a retirement home in Ontario, you must be licensed and comply with the law that protects seniors. Requirements of this law include a duty for operating. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the minister. Great to have you here, Minister. Mr. Speaker, I've been fortunate enough to visit a number of retirement homes and their residents over the course of the election. Given that maintaining resident safety is paramount to this government, how many licensed retirement homes are in Ontario, and what is the retirement home's regulatory authority's role in ensuring that residents are kept safe? Bonds. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, currently there are over 730 retirement homes licensed in Ontario and subject to care and safety standards. Since becoming the Minister of Seniors and Accessibility, I have already met with the retirement homes regulatory authority representative. I'm confident that the authority will continue to take all necessary steps needed to protect residents and make sure their safety and well-being is maintained. For example, the authority has completed over 6,000 inspections of retirement homes. These inspections include responding to reports of abuse and neglect, Response. evaluating in licensing suitability, checking of compliance with the Act. Mr. Speaker, in summary, this government is committed to ensuring that return homes across the province are safe here, here. and secure for all its residents. Stop the clock. <laughs> Members, will please take your seat. We start the clock. Member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Let's Premier. Since the Premier was sworn in, jobs are being cut at Sudbury Hospital. At least 51 hardworking, de dedicated health care providers are set to lose their jobs at Health Sciences North. The union presidents say, and I agree, these hospital's employees are stressed to the hilt. These jobs rest in the Premier's hand. He has the power to stop those layoffs and funding hospital enough to have the staff that they need. My question is simple. Will the Deputy Premier stop these job cuts at Health Sciences North in Sudbury? Deputy Premier. Thank you very much to the member for the question. This is a serious issue. I am aware that the Sudbury Hospital has had some significant financial difficulties, and so I can assure you that the um, members of the, the ministry is well aware of the situation, and we are urging the hospital to continue to work with the Lynn to resolve this so that job losses are kept to an absolute minimum. We know that people need care. We know that they, uh, they can't be laid, laying off any more people than necessary. They have already received some money from the ministry. $4.6 million to aid in the financial situation. There is more work to be done. The Lynn is working very carefully with the hospital on this issue. Supplementary. Speaker, Ontario Hospital cannot afford more cuts and more layoffs. They have been cut to the bone 
by the last Conservative government and by the last Liberal government. Today, every hospital in Northern Ontario are on the brink of financial crisis. In fact, the board chairs of the four biggest hospitals in the North Northeast penned a letter that says they are struggling to deliver services in, and I quote, a fiscal environment that threatens the basic financial survival. The last thing our Northern Ontario hospital need is more cuts, is more layoff, and longer wait time for the families in the Northeast. Will the Deputy Premier stop the cuts at Sudbury Hospital and place a complete moratorium on job cuts in Ontario hospitals? We start the clock. Deputy Premier, response. Well, I would say to the member through you, Mr. Speaker, that the, some of the concerns being experienced at the Sudbury Hospital and some of the other northern hospitals demonstrates the need for system improvement and accountability. After 15 years, lack of improvement and lack of care by the previous Liberal government. We are committed to improving the situation. That is why we are working very closely through the ministry and with the LIN to deal with the situation right now at Sudbury to make sure that they can become financially viable as soon as possible. That is why uh, $4.8 million I changed, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, uh, changing that number to address the correct number, $4.8 million, to improve the situation. There may be more work that needs to be done, but we are dealing with the situation very closely, and we will make changes where we have to. Next question. Member for Waterloo. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, la <laughs> last week, uh, my question is to the Acting Premier. Last week, the government announced that it had cancelled 758 renewable energy projects. One of those projects, one of those projects, was a hydroelectric power plant to be built on the Park Hill Road Dam in Cambridge. The Grand River Conservation Authority has been working for decades to get approvals for the project that would provide nearly 600 homes with cheap, reliable electricity. Hydroelectricity. Instead, the contract was cancelled with no notice. That means lost jobs for the people of Waterloo Region without taking one cent off of anyone's hydro bills. Speaker. What does the government have to say to the 600 families who will now see higher hydro bills because your government scrapped their cheap, reliable, and environmentally friendly alternative? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What would I say? Well, three words, but I'll take my 60 seconds anyways. Help is here, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Because those people, those people like all Ontarians, are going to experience $790 million worth of relief from cancelling those projects, Mr. That Speaker, most of them that communities didn't need or want, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We're committed to cutting hydro rates, not subsidizing them for future generations to take on that burden, Mr. Speaker. This is a promise made and a promise kept for today, Mr. Another Speaker. Day. Member for Waterloo, restart the clock. Mr. Speaker, those people that the minister refers to are going to pay higher hydro rates. They're going to lose their jobs. They're going to have compromised contracts in the province of Ontario. Speaker, the government is getting rid of any renewable energy contract that their insider friends don't approve of. The Park Hill Road Dam would have provided nearly 600 families with cheap, reliable, environmentally friendly hydroelectricity. Cancelling government contracts in this manner undermines investor confidence. It signals to the business community that the government of Ontario cannot be trusted as a business partner. Speaker, will the government do the right thing and fulfill their contractual obligations for the people in Waterloo Region? Well, what we're going to do, Mr. Speaker, is fulfill our promise. Our promise to reduce hydro rates by 12 percent, to cut them, Mr. Speaker, not subsidize them, as this member and her party had supported time and time again when the Liberals were ruining our hydro with the Unfair Hydro Act, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to renewing Hydro One's leadership. We're committed to re getting rid of the carbon tax that's putting a burden on families and businesses, Mr. Speaker. Ontario is open for business. We're making one promise after another and keeping one promise 
after another, Mr. Speaker. And her members are going to feel that when we hear up the clock. Members will take their seats. We start the clock. Next question, the member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, this government made a solemn commitment to deliver positive results for the people of this province. In nine short days, in nine days, Mr. Speaker, we have delivered renewed leadership at Hydro One and the cancellation of bad energy contracts. Mr. Speaker, a promise made, promise kept. Yes. Mr. Speaker, we ended the longest strike on campus in the history of this country at York University. A promise made and a oh, promise yeah. kept. Mr. Speaker, yesterday our new government took decisive action to scrap the punitive scrap and, uh, uh, cap, cap and trade carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Energy, could the Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker, commit today to another promise made and another promise kept? Good energy. Stop the clock. Minister of Energy. I thank the member for his thorough understanding of this bill. I want to thank the House Leader and uh, the Whip and all of our colleagues for chiming in on the debate, as well as the members uh, across the way. One thing was clear, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians wanted their students to go back to class, Mr. Yes. Speaker. Promise made, promise kept. They didn't want to spend $790 million. Uh, sorry, they wanted to save $790 million, yes. Mr. Speaker, instead of wasting it on projects that they didn't want and they didn't need. Here, here. And they wanted Hydro One's leadership to be renewed, and that's exactly what's going on, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. Promise made. Promise kept. Yeah. 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 Members will take their seats. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the Minister of Energy. It is refreshing, Mr. Speaker, to hear to finally have a government that actually delivers on their word, that, that rolls up their sleeves in the service of the people. Mr. Speaker, this is the realization of responsible government. It's proud to serve with you, sir. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Energy outline today how our low tax plan for the economy will help create good value added jobs in our economy and create the conditions for prosperity in every region of this province? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been thinking a lot about that, hearing about the NDP math here. It sounds a lot like it did in Ottawa. Their forestry policy is their fiscal policy. Their fiscal policy is their forestry policy. They think money grows on trees. We know, Mr. Speaker, that it comes from Ontario taxpayers, from their pockets, Mr. Speaker. They voted for a government that would reel in wasteful spending, Mr. Speaker. They smelled something fishy about the NDP plan, some $5 billion worth of fishiness in their platform, Mr. Speaker. We're going to, take, we're going to cast our net wide. We're going to clean up wasteful spending. We're going to create prosperity and opportunity for Ontarians from uh, Windsor clear across to the great city of Kenora, Mr. Speaker. Help is here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members will please take their seats. Next question. Restart the clock. Member for Timmins. Well, my question, uh, Mr. Speaker, through you is to the Deputy Premier. Premier, we, Deputy Premier, we see yet again more backroom deals by the Tories, where Doug Ford went out, talked to some big polluters, talked to people that had money, and said, what kind of deal can I help you with? And now we have legislation in place that's going to allow the largest polluters in this province to get off the hook from taking the responsibility of making sure that they're good citizens and they don't pollute our environment to the degree they are now, and you're shifting the burden onto individuals. So why, Premier, Deputy Premier, can you tell me why does Doug Ford and the Conservatives choose to stand with the big polluters and not with the people of Ontario? Of the environment. Mr. Speaker, through, through you to the member, I, I appreciate the opportunity to say yet again that the era of the carbon tax in Ontario is over. Why the members opposite attack employers, why they attack business on one hand and then say they're in favour of them, I don't know. But 
Our approach is an approach that's based on what's best for Ontario families. We were elected on a mandate to get rid of the cap-and-trade carbon tax. We will put forward a climate change plan that's sensible, that understands environmental and economic realities. But, Mr. Speaker, the era of the carbon tax in Ontario, it's over. So, here, here. Supplementary. Premier, again to the Deputy Premier, that doesn't cut it. The reality is you guys made a choice, and your choice was to stand with those big polluters and making sure that you stood with them and you don't stand with the people of Ontario. People in this province understand there is a thing called climate change, yes, and we have to do something about it. And instead, you stand with the big polluters by way of backroom deals, and you say, I choose to stand with the big polluters. So I ask you again, why are you turning your back on the people of Ontario? Response, Minister. Mr. Chief, Mr. Speaker, Doug Ford and the PC government chose the people. Here, here. We're for the people. We chose to put money back in people's pockets. We chose to listen to the people about their concerns, about the things that they cared about. They do care about the environment. That's why we will have programs around conservation, around clean air, around clean water, around reducing greenhouse gases. But we will also put $260 back in their pockets every year. The people across can laugh at $260, and we will employ 14,000 more people with the elimination of the cap-and-trade program and our gas tax cut. Time for question period has expired. There being no deferred votes, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.